Okay. Welcome to the program, Responding to Reviewers, uh, the second part of GSA's Manuscript Writing and Reviewing Skills Program, developed by a GSA workgroup of members from around the world. We have a few housekeeping items to go through, uh, but first, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, we'd like to know who's here. Um, please also use the chat box um, for any comments and clarifying questions uh, throughout the program. Our program is being recorded today, uh, so and we will archive this recording on GSA's website. So we'll ask uh, you to keep your audio on mute, please. Uh, without further delay, I'll hand the microphone um, to Dr. Sean Halpin, Senior Research Associate associate with Evadera. Sean? Hi, Judy. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here talking about advice for responding to reviewers. Um, first, can you hear me okay? I'm going to assume that's a yes. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Eifert, and I was just emailing with Dr. Rose who is uh, logging on will be joining us shortly. Uh, each of us will be presenting different sections of this presentation today. Uh, there's several kind of hands-on components that we built into the slide deck, and it gives you an opportunity to practice what we're discussing. Uh, but I, I see the number of participants increasing. We have over 100 people that are registered for today. And, and given that, uh, we're, we're going to actually not do the hands-on component during the presentation, but the slides will be made available to you afterwards. Um, also, our volunteer work group, group, that larger group that you saw flashed on the screen uh, just a moment ago, will be presenting uh, this, responding to reviewers, uh, as well as the other components of uh, what we've been working on at the GSA annual conference. So be on the lookout for that uh, and when we do our in-person conference this year. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So when I was first getting started publishing in journals, I found that process of responding to reviewers to kind of be baffling. Uh, but there was also this kind of internal feeling that I should already know how to do it. Uh, kind of like a baby fawn that kind of innately knows how to walk. But honestly, I didn't have a good idea of where to start. And ultimately, I ended up learning by doing especially getting advice from different co-authors and from building my own map of the process and the approach for responding to reviewers kind of as I went along. And over the years, as I grew my own list of publications, I've moved into a role of mentoring junior investigators. I found that my experience with learning how to respond to reviewers is pretty common. In fact, just before we logged on here, I was talking with one of our expert reviewers and he said, man, I wish I had something like this when, when I first got started. Um, this is not a topic that gets a lot of attention or maybe not at all in university courses. And as a result, researchers are just expected to apprentice their way out of it and, and learn from their co-authors. And of course, some co-authors are better at guiding along the process than others. Uh, next slide, please, Judy. So this figure gives an overview of the editorial process. Uh, in other words, this is what happens to your manuscript after you click submit, everything behind the scenes. And at a quick glance, you can see there's several pathways uh, at the beginning, and they're all beginning with that editor receives a manuscript portion. And the paper could come back rejected, it might get outright accepted, or the journal can come back and ask for minor or major revisions. We're gonna explore, we will explore each of those pathways during this presentation. We'll give some advice on how to craft your response when appropriate. Uh, next slide, please. So when we spend months and sometimes years pouring ourselves into a manuscript, it's easy for that paper to feel like an extension of our own body. There's a need of validation as a scholar or at least a defensive feeling when a reviewer comes back with what you feel might be an unwarranted critique. It's easy for us to get really, really mad at reviewers for kind of missing the point of your paper or overlooking some important bit of information. Uh, so, so personally, several times I've gotten a review back and thought, man, what were you thinking reviewer? Just go to page seven, your answer is right there. 
uh, so I'm in the same boat. I've felt it too. Uh, we won't be getting into how to be a good reviewer so much in this presentation, but I do think it's important to set the stage in general by highlighting the purpose of being a reviewer. Remember, reviewers are volunteering their time to give back with the spirit of improving published literature. And with all that in mind, I think that this sentence here is a helpful reminder uh, as we get into the reviewer comments and, and back and we actually receive those back and when we first read them. So try to understand the comments from different reviewers as a chance to make your paper better. And I'll share just one uh, example. Um, a few years back, I was publishing a, an article actually in the Gerontologist and um, I, this was a paper that I felt like this is my magnus open. This is like, this is what I wanna really work on. Really excited about it. And I get back the reviewer comments, the, the first pass through and I think, oh my gosh, they missed, they completely missed the point. And then it came back over and over and, I, and it actually went through six rounds of revision. And during that process, I was talking with someone that actually wasn't a co-author on the paper, uh, but a mentor to me. And she said, you know what? They must really want you to get this published. And, and that mind switch for me, that, that being able to switch over from, man, they're attacking me and they're gatekeepers keeping me away from getting my, my very important paper published to actually they're trying to make this more accessible for a broader audience really helped me uh, to get through and I actually improve the paper. And I think it's a bit much better paper because of the process. So I, I wanna start with that in mind. We, we can go on to the next slide. Um, throughout the presentation, we have some touch points where we'll be asking for, uh, if you have any clarifying questions, you can put in the chat and we can answer those. I realize this first one is really close to the front. Um, so you might not have any at this point, that's the totally fine. Um, as we go through the rest of the presentation, if you do have any, uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go along. Um, try to make them more general rather than very pointed individual questions, if possible, that will kind of benefit the broader audience. Uh, also recognizing as we get to the end, we have some really fantastic expert reviewers, editors in their field, and people that have done a lot of reviews for uh, GSA journals that are going to be fielding questions. So that's another opportunity uh, to ask some of your questions there. Um, not seeing anything in the chat, we think we can go ahead and go on and uh, Dr. Eifert uh, will be taking on the next section. Thanks so much. I think you're on mute. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Helpin, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to give a breakdown of the different types of responses from journals. And there's a lot of diversity in responses. So this is definitely going to be a, a broad overview. And you may see things differently in the real world. Next slide, please. The, the first decision that I want to introduce to you is acceptance. And this is, you know, the ideal. This is what we all want. Um, an accepted manuscript means uh, the paper is accepted for publication without any um, further required changes from the, the authors. And as you can see on the screen, this can happen without peer review, although that's, that's very, very rare. It probably only happens when um, a manuscript is specifically solicited by the editor. Most manuscripts will go through the peer review process, which is the background of the scientific publishing. So acceptance often depends on what the reviewers say, um, which we'll get to that in, in a little bit. One of the things that I think is, is really important and that I want to illustrate is that um, going through the publishing process, there are different acceptance rates for journals that you submit to. It, it varies from journal to journal, but overall it's around 37% is, is which one study said. So in theory, a little over a third of manuscripts written and submitted for publication are accepted. And so I hope that puts things in perspective for you for, for how common it is to get an accepted manuscript. 
Next slide, please. The next decision to be introduced is rejection. Uh, again, as you can see, a manuscript can be rejected immediately by the editor without peer review, or it can be rejected after the peer review process. And there are dozens and dozens of reasons for a manuscript to be rejected. Um, we're going to discuss that in a, in a second. But first, um, I want to show you some examples of rejection letters from journals because they can be informative, they can be very telling, um, and they should provide a reason for why a manuscript was not considered for the journal. Next slide, please. So here are two examples of rejection letters. They're actually just a couple of sentences kind of pulled out from entire rejection letters. Um, but these specifically are rejection letters after the peer review process. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to read this to you word for word, um, but you can kind of pull out certain words um, like the reviewers, unfortunately, still feel like the manuscript does not meet the requ requirements of research for the journal. So that the editor is is basically telling you even after review, even after peer review, after revisions, um, it's still not up to their standards for some reason, and they're not able to publish the manuscript the manuscript. Um, another very nice way to say it, the authors tried their best, um, but they've been unable to um, address the issues raised by um, the reviewers. Um, and so usually letters like this will be um, accompanied with a full peer review. So you'll get not only the letter from the editor, but you'll also get the reviews from the different peer reviewers. And that could be um, anywhere between two and five. It could be more. It really just depends on um, the journal. Next slide, please. Now, these are another set of examples of rejection letters. Um, this is from um, rejection letters without review. So these often come back very, very quickly. Um, typically, what happens is the editor will look at the manuscript or do a, a quick overview of it. And if he or she um, or if they decide at that time that it's not appropriate for whatever reason, um, a rejection notice will be um, sent out to the authors. Um, and so again, they'll they'll tell you in those re those letters, you know, why they couldn't um, accept the paper or why they are not going to send the paper out for review at this time. So carefully reading that letter, um, you can see here um, this this um, editor said due to overall page constraints, this isn't a good time. Um, the second paragraph, um, you'll see that it's not appropriate um, for this specific uh, journal. So they're telling you and giving me giving you reasons right there why the letter um, or why the manuscript isn't going to be sent for review. Next slide, please. Um, publishing can be immensely frustrating um, after you've spent, I, I, Dr. Halpin alluded to this, that, you know, you've spent many, many hours of research and writing and perfecting your, your manuscript um, to receive this rejection letter from your selected journal. And sometimes it feels very personal because you've poured your heart and soul into this, this manuscript. Um, sometimes that decision comes quickly and you can get over it. Other times it takes weeks before you receive notification that you've been, you know, rejected. And it's just a punch in the gut. However, uh, the peer review process at its heart is intended, is intended to augment, you know, scientific publications by, um, you know, increasing the quality 
Um, and, and so that your science stands up to scrutiny. So once you rec recover from some of that frustration of rejection, um, it's really helpful to consider that feedback that you've received and, and consider it and look at it as an opportunity to improve your research. Even if your reviewers did not use the kindest words, um, their ideas likely still have, have merit. So your strategy moving forward kind of depends on you know, the responses that you received, the feedback that you got from the editor um, and the peer reviewers. So don't get dis discouraged when you inevitably have a manuscript rejected. I've had a manuscript rejected before. It happens to um, it, it, us all. Um, and just remember, there are a lot of journal options. And so eventually you'll find the right um, journal for for or the right fit for your manuscripts. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some common reasons for manuscript rejection. Um, <clears throat> there are often um, manuscripts in queue waiting to be published by the journal, and you have no way of knowing what the topic of these manuscripts are or what these manuscripts are, are that are eventually going to come out. And unfortunately, they may be very similar to what your manuscript is, is discussing. And so the editor may not want to have back to back manuscripts on the same topic. Um, and so in this case, you know, your manuscript may be immediately rejected or, or won't be considered. Um, and remember that decision, the decision letters that I shared earlier, you know, the, hopefully the editor will tell you that this is the specific reason for your rejection. Um, and if that's the case, it, it's understandable. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's not personal. Next slide, please. Another reason for immediate rejection is fit. I'll share an example. I, I'm an assistant editor for a journal for community health education, and we get manuscripts for school health or we get manuscripts for um, education in medical settings. And these are not appropriate for our journal. They're not appropriate for our readers. Our readership just wouldn't be interested. Um, and so oftentimes when we get manuscripts like that, they're immediately rejected for fit. You know, anytime you're going to write and submit to a specific journal, you want to really carefully read the mission and the aims and the scope for that journal. So you don't waste your time trying to publish um, in the wrong journal for your work. Similarly, uh, you want to make sure the journal is publishing the type of article that you plan to submit. There are all types of manuscripts. Some journals will publish literature reviews while others won't. Uh, some journals will publish commentaries while others won't. Um, so you have to, again, carefully read that specifically, specific journal and you need to write and publish, to, to, you know, submit towards that specific journal. So just be aware of the type of articles that are being published by the journal. Oftentimes you can you know, go and search and look in the past year uh, of the different articles that were published in that journal. And if you're not seeing your type of research article or your type of manuscript that you want published, then that journal is probably not the right fit for you. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned earlier this acceptance rate of, of journal articles um, around 37%, but you should definitely be aware that some journals are close to 1%. They only accept the best of the best and they're, they're very highly competitive. And these journals are typically ones with high impact factors. And so the impact factor or IF is a measure of the frequency with which the average article in the journal has been cited in a particular um, um, year, like in the past year. So it's used to measure the importance or rank 
of a journal, the, the higher the impact factor, the, the um, more highly ranked the journal is, which also means it's, it's more difficult to get published in. If you get rejected from a high impact journal, you know, it's, that's pretty normal and, and it's okay. Um, there are lots of other journals that are less competitive. So uh, uh, there are reasons why people pursue high impact journals, but they're not the end all be all. So, you know, you definitely want to look into, um, you know, the impact factor and the rank of certain journals and, and make the best decision for your research and your manuscript. Um, and, and you may want to consider a less competitive manuscript to submit to. Next slide, please. Um, this, there's a whole slew of reasons here um, related to rejection, but, you know, inappropriate study designs, poor method, um, weak study rationale. These are really common rejection reasons that are mentioned by both peer reviewers and, and editors. So um, prospective authors should pay adequate attention to, to the conceptualization and the design to avoid rejection and kind of enhance their manuscripts chances of, of publication. Um, you know, the good news is that is a lot of times you can take feedback from peer reviewers, you can improve your manuscript and you can submit um, for publication to another journal. So, you know, if they're making comments or you're getting feedback about the, the study design or the methods that were used, you know, you have to think really carefully about um, how you can address those, those issues. Next slide, please. Lastly, I can't stress enough the importance of the written presentation of your study. Um, researchers can have an incredible study, but if it's not communicated clearly, there's a good chance that it could be rejected for, for public publication. I tell my students all the time, and I'll repeat it here to you, proofread, proofread, proofread. Have somebody else proofread. You want to make sure that when you're submitting your manuscript that you've really limited grammatical and um, syntax errors so that the manuscript is very easily readable. Um, this can be additionally challenging for non-native English speakers. Um, luckily, there are some services for English proofreading that um, I would definitely encourage people to pursue um, and that are recommended for authors who plan to submit, submit manuscripts for English language-based journals. Next slide, please. <coughs> So manuscript publishing is a roller coaster ride. I think everybody who's been there will tell you it's a it's a journey with highs and lows, with elation and extreme disappointment. Um, and what you see here really is a comparison of of publishing with the the Kubler Ross grief cycle, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. With so often when we get that rejection. Um, from, a, from a, a journal, we go through a denial phase, we go through an anger phase, we go through a bargaining phase before we kind of move on to final acceptance and hopefully um, addressing maybe reviewers' concerns or deciding to move on to a different manuscript. Um, and again, we just want to normalize this and want to reassure, reassure you of, you know, this publishing process and the feelings that may kind of bubble up um, when you get a rejection um, or some other response from an editor. Next slide, please. So here's an example of um, some of the side activities that um, Dr. Halpin alluded to that um, we're, not, we're gonna kind of breeze over this, but we definitely, if you get the chance, we, we want you to do these activities on your own and hopefully we'll see you at GSA in November and we can do some of these face-to-face. -face. Next slide, please. 
The final decision uh, I want to introduce you to is revisions. Um, and these revisions can be minor, they can be major, they can also be significant enough that the editor wants you to, to resubmit at a later time. So it may be a reject with major revisions. Um, re revisions are a good thing. Um, as it's been mentioned, this is an opportunity to greatly improve your man's manuscript based on the feedback from other people who have read it. Next slide, please. Here are two examples of revision letters from, um, or letters from the editor requesting revisions um, and stating that the manuscript needs some further changes. So again, you'll get this letter from the editor, but then it will also be accompanied with multiple peer review feedback from reviewers. Um, <coughs> so uh, reading between the lines here, uh, um, you know, if you believe you can address the reviewer's comments, we'd be pleased to see a revised manuscript. So the editor here is asking you to address the reviewer's comment and revise your, your manuscript and submit again. Um, the second paragraph, same thing. Your manuscript's been reviewed. There are comments at the bottom. We'd love to see some major revisions um, before we can, we can publish. So this is an invitation to you to address the reviewer's concerns and improve your manuscript. Next slide, please. Here's um, again, another um, example of, of revision letters um, that the state, uh, that the manuscript needs some, some further changes. So, you know, read between those lines, the, the editor's communicating something important here. Um, you know, the editors, the reviewers found it interesting, but there are limit limitations. If you can revise the, if you can address this and revise this, we can offer assurance that it will be accepted in the future. Um, and then the second paragraph, it's been reviewed, comments are at the bottom. We regret to inform you that the reviewers have raised serious concerns. Typically those concerns are serious enough that maybe it can't be overcome with revisions. Um, and so you'll get that feedback, you can address it and then hopefully submit to another journal. Next slide, please. I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. I haven't been reading the chat, so please let me know. There's a question here, uh, Elise. Do you have to pay to resubmit? So I think there's a lot of variety um, here. Uh, Sean, Martina, if I actually have no experience with, with pay, uh, pay for publishing papers, um, I don't know if either of you do, and you may off, be able to offer some advice on this question or to answer this question. Uh, hi, this is Martina. Um, uh, the experience I have is that I would say in the open access where you have to pay, you only pay once it is accepted. Because I mean, if you're resubmitting it, the paper has not been accepted and the bill only comes when the pipe paper finally has been accepted. I wanna jump in and add, um, and this is a really, I'm glad you brought this up, thank you. Um, there's lots of different routes to submitting your paper. Most journals, won't ask for money up front to submit your paper. Um, and honestly, most of those, the journals that are asking for money up front, these kind of pay to play ones are good ones to avoid uh, because they, they tend to be not as critical about um, what's been put into their, their uh, papers, right? They might have reviewers that are being especially critical. Um, that peer reviewed process might not be honored. Uh, so there definitely are these, what we call predatory journals out there. Um, and, and those are the ones that tend to ask for money to submit. And whether they ask for you to submit uh, or to pay more when you're revising, I don't know how that process goes. Um, 
as uh, Dr. Rose just mentioned, there's uh, open access options, which is increasingly common, where um, you'll be asked to pay a fee at the end uh, of the, uh, uh, once your paper is actually accepted. And that will make it freely available to anyone that wants to download. Um, otherwise, you'll uh, have the kind of traditional model where people uh, will only have access to it. Um, one, if they have access to uh, a subscription to a university or the, their employer to that journal, they're paying already to have access to this journal, or after an embargo period, which often is about 12 months, um, then you as the author can post it uh, on something like ResearchGate. Um, so those are that's three different methods of kind of getting your paper out there. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Martina Rose. Thank you, Dr. Eifert. Uh, this is Martina Rose. I think we can go to the next slide because now we are talking about how to respond. And I really want to point out, I mean, I'm sitting in the lobby, so I hope the background noises are not too uh, tricky. Um, so I want to highlight the term strategy for revision. And the second thing I wanted to say up front is uh, if you're a doctoral student or if you're a master's student who want to publish and this is your first publication, or even if you have um, you know, published a couple of papers, discuss the revision, the feedback from the reviewers directly with your senior. Because uh, the expertise you will get from the seniors is also, first of all, to understand what is meant by major and minor revision. And I guess we have already seen what Dr. Eifert was telling us, um, you know, how reviewers are drafting it. And um, the seniors really can help to better understand what is meant by the comments from the editors and the reviewers. And uh, the experience I have made with my team is that quite often we don't understand why some are saying it's major or minor revision. So it, it seems like that it's probably more the, the individual idea of the reviewer uh, if they got the impression that it is major or minor because I have seen reviewers uh, where there are lots of comments and I still said it's only minor revision, but I also have seen where there are only a few comments, but they were saying it's major revision. So you really have to um, clearly read all the comments, but also to understand what the key message is from the editors and reviewers. And what uh, Dr. Eifert was telling us is the uh, perspective of um, you know how the introduction of the reviewer sounds, but then the detail will come later on. So, and then I think what you see on this slide also is that it uh, prepares you for that emotional kind of a feeling that Dr. Halpin was also pointing out. Um, the example he was providing when you have the feeling, oh, you're reading and you have poured all your blood and energy and engagement in this one. And then in the end you think, oh no, hold on a second. Um, why did they not like that kind of paper? And I think that is uh, what we're trying to say here, to really um, step back, uh, let the emotion uh, settle in, and take some break, discuss it with your co-authors and with your seniors to overcome that feeling that you um, see that, uh, you know, they have criticized something where you think, oh no, hold on a second, this is really true. Um, and the next three or four slides provide some kind of examples, how the details, you can move forward. So you see how detailed sometimes comments to the authors are. I mean, I don't wanna read everything that is um, said on this slide, but what you see is that you have to understand uh, what is the key message. So for example, here you have an idea of that it is unclear whether the measure, measures for the analysis were added to the survey or required modification of the existing survey protocol. So I think you got lots of information what you could work on, and then you have to start to understand what exactly is meant. The next slide, please. And then uh, what is of utter uh, most importance is um, that you have a strategy how you want to draft the comments 
for what the reviewer was commenting on. So usually very often the journals, but of course that is different depending on the journal, require that you either provide a table or a written text. And that if you use a table, you have the comment on uh, from the reviewers on the left hand side, then you have your own comment and then you have the information where in your article you changed uh, based on, on your comments. And it is also important that, uh, for example, if you have um, a, a clear paragraph that you also address uh, in which paragraph that uh, changed part of the article can be found. Because what you really want to um, provide the reviewers is that they will easily see how you reacted, what is your argument, and how you changed the article. The next slide, please. And then, uh, and then I think you can uh, click once more. Yeah, so, and then what you see, the response. I mean, so you have a critical response from the reviewer, but then your response still should be very friendly, uh, you know, not from that emotional kind of perspective. And then you show what you have changed and you point out where you would find that kind of change. Next slide, please. So uh, as you already see what I said with the strategy, how you want to respond, what I um, already pointed out on the first slide is, uh, you also have to check how the journal wants you to respond. Uh, so if they have a specific formats, quite often it is a table, but not all the time, um, then you have to follow um, this kind of guidance uh, because otherwise you may uh, submit the review and they're, they're going to reject because they say you didn't follow the lines and then you have to start all over again. Um, and as you already can see what I was pointing out to the format is important um, because what they really want to see is on one side your argument um, based on the comment from the reviewer. And the second is really then uh, that I see directly what you change in the article. Uh, the journal guidelines uh, sometimes are not very clear on how to respond for reviewers. So that's the reason why you can turn to seniors because seniors have an idea uh, how to um, handle that gap if the journal is not providing this. But the key message is still the same. You need a clear format that the reviewer would uh, be able to read only maybe the table of your comments and your revised version uh, to better understand how you change the article. Uh, next slide, please. And I think uh, it was already uh, very clear from the beginning what Dr. Halpin and Dr. Eifert were also pointing out. Uh, keep track on your emotion, you know, because I mean, if you if you use your emotional response, specifically if if you're uh, uh, having issues with to understand what the reviewer meant, or if you feel criticized for, um, with regard to a point that is of uh, high relevance for you, then it is very important uh, to learn how to answer in a diplomatic kind of way, uh, because otherwise you're going in a circle of angry people. And uh, then in the end, we have that Václavik, uh, keep your hammer because I don't need the hammer. I don't need the nail. And, uh, and I think that is not what you want. Uh, of course, it's not easy to remember to not take it personally. Um, and that is the reason why it is very important that you discuss it with your co-authors and also with the seniors because they will help you to sort it out. Um, the time response is uh, for each journal very different. Uh, sometimes you only have like a couple days to respond, even if it is a major revision. So that is another argument from my perspective to talk to your seniors uh, and to think about uh, what the impression is, um, how long it will take. Uh, because sometimes if you provide a review, uh, we have seen that they are saying, well, you know, you have to make an update. And depending on the topic, you may need a time for the update. And you can do that in 10 to 14 days. So don't be afraid to ask for an extended time. But be clear that you are not um, providing uh, or asking for an extended time, which you have to revise because you're not meeting that kind of time. 
Um, and that is something where you have to discuss it uh, in detail really with your team uh, so you have a better understanding of how, how long you may take. But once you have the review uh, comments, uh, this is going to be your priority. So you really have to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do now. Uh, next slide, please. This is very important. Um, thank you, the reviewers, for their time and comments. So sometimes what we are doing in our team is that we, uh, in each comment, uh, we have some kind of places where we say, oh, thanks for pointing that out. We didn't think about it. Or thank you for pointing out uh, because it was, um, we didn't understand it uh, clearly um, or whatever. It, so it is like, to really uh, bring back a positive feeling to the reviewers. And that will also help you uh, to uh, develop a positive uh, emotional uh, feeling toward the reviewer. <clears throat> if you need a cover letter, that will be a requirement of the journal. You will see that. And then, of course, as I already said, avoid the defensive and conventional term. So what I see is I'm a senior, so all my uh, colleagues, if I'm not involved in, in the paper myself uh, and in the review comments, they always send it to me and I'm always, uh, you know, uh, doing the diplomatic kind of review. And I think that is uh, where uh, seniors really can help you with. Uh, the goal here is, and I think that's, that's clear right now, Glean, any useful information from the review. So because the intention of the review is to make your people better. Uh, and then it, it is not to criticize, but really like what um, Dr. Halpin was saying, six revision. So of course they really wanted to have that paper. So the review comments are to make that paper better. And then I guess in the end, you will see that you really made it better. Next slide, please. Here you see some kind of uh, uh, um, examples uh, you can do by your own, but I think it's really uh, helpful to overcome your emotional reaction. So for example, what you want to say, oh, you're too stupid to understand what I wrote or what our study is all about. Uh, but then of course the, the diplomatic answer would be a different one. Or um, the last one, um, well, we can time travel and uh, change the study design. And so, I mean, then of course you can think about how do you diplomatically uh, rephrase that uh, kind of emotion. The next slide, please. Here's the same. Of course, that is, an, uh, that is a reaction I very often see from my colleagues. Did you even read what we wrote? Uh, because sometimes you really have the feeling from the comments that they totally missed the point. Uh, but then you have to dig deep because you don't want to answer that way. Uh, next slide, please. Writing your response, uh, there's no rule that you must make all changes. And I think this is a really a critical point uh, because sometimes uh, there's lots of uh, pointers. And then also sometimes uh, the reviewers provide uh, additional literature, maybe literature there, where they are co-authors or first authors. So you really have to look into what is your argument, how you react to the reviewers comment. And based on this, you can decide which changes you're going to make. And it's, it's, it's fine to say, well, that's a good point, but that is not of relevance for our paper. Uh, but you have to argue why it is not um, part of your paper. The next slide, please. Do as much as possible of what the reviewer asks. I think this is, uh, this is tricky because sometimes it could be proofreading Sometimes it could be an update of a review because there are a couple months in between. Sometimes it could be a reference to a theoretical concept or an, uh, an empirical kind of analysis you have to conduct. So I think this goes in, li in line with how to set priorities for what you need to do. And uh, this is more uh, to sharpen your paper because then maybe you have packed in too much information and that confused the reviewer. And now you can reduce it because now you have a better understanding of what might be a key message and then you can set priorities and uh, that will help you to decide um, how much of what the reviewer was commenting you have to answer. Next slide, please. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we not include, yeah, this is just an example. We not included this as a limitation in a discussion. If you have provided an argument why you are not including this one in that specific case. Next slide, please. There's no page limit to a response. This is true um, because most uh, journals are not providing any kind of requirements. Um, we want to see that all points have been acknowledged and addressed that uh, in my understanding is very easy if you use a table, because then you can go from A to B and you have review one at the beginning and then review two at the end. Uh, and then you can really structure your response and provide the changes um, they have uh, required. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I think you have to click again. Yeah, so here's the response. So, I mean, these are just examples. So you have a better idea of how you could phrase based on the comment from the major concerns. Next slide, please. This is the same. So you could practice for your own to write an answer how you would comment on that example. Next slide, please. So here's an example how you could uh, how you could write that. Um, so I'm not going to read everything because <laughs> it's a lot, but uh, you get an idea. Next slide, please. Reviews might have conflicting comments. This is uh, um, this is really sometimes a big issue because one is saying major revision, the other is saying minor revision. One is saying uh, um, a go direction A, and the other is saying go re direction B. And uh, the, the the recommendation we are making here is pick one and explain why. And and I think that is another reason where you have to prioritize and also have to discuss it with your authors and with your seniors because it has an impact on in which direction your article will be phrased and uh, and maybe you can't uh, use both conflicting comments in your article so you really have to choose what is your key message uh, based on the um, corresponding uh, responses from the reviews next slide please Co-authors is what I already said. Splitting up revisions can happen. It really depends on what kind of paper it is. So if you're doing a review, it could be that someone uh, is more focusing on the methodology and the other one is more focusing on maybe the discussion points. If you have an empirical study, it could be that you have a statistician. And if the comments are related to the statistician, then of course the uh, statistic person can uh, write the revisions. Uh, but in the end, it's the first author that is is responsible for um, you know the overview of every change uh, that has been made. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, just a reference that you can uh, use further information on the GSA manuscript writing program. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we are coming to an end. Use the chat box to ask and clarify questions. So thanks for listening to us. That's a, that's a good one. So um, the, the question from Todd is uh, how long to wait before to ask uh, what the status is. So usually most of the journals uh, I know, the, uh, first of all, you can see the status where, they, um, uh, where the article is. Sometimes quite a few journals offer an information upfront how long the editor takes to make a decision and then how long usually the reviewers have to make a decision. So that is maybe even something if it is like, you know, career wise, uh, you need that article, then maybe you're not choosing a journal that is already saying upfront, while well, the editor needs up to three months to decide if the article is even going into the, um, in the, into the review. Um, I have waited as about 11 months before. So what we usually say uh, and we have good experience with is so if you submit the paper and then the journal says well you know up to one month or maybe 14 days the editor has made a decision that it's going to the reviewer 
then the reviewer is like, um, you know, working, working, working. Sometimes the journals come back to you and says, well, you know, we have asked five reviewers and they're all denied because they don't have time or they are not having the expertise. Please provide reviewer names. That is something you probably can look up upfront or you can ask the editor upfront if it is possible to point out to reviewers, because then you could talk to these people who you have in mind and ask if they would accept that you would do a review. Uh, but that is a journal-wise very different. Some accept that and some say, well, you know, we have our own reviews, we don't want you to interfere. But it could happen that they figured out we don't have reviewers and they come back to you and they wanted to have reviews. Um, so the the other edge we have in our institute is more like that if we have submitted, it's under review and we haven't heard anything um, uh, in, in within three months based on a very short period of time that the journal is providing that the review has done, then we start to ask about the status of the review uh, and ask if we can help in any kind of way. But it could happen and um, that is really something you have to decide if you want to uh, withdraw, that if you have to wait up to one month and you know there are other journals, you should consider uh, maybe uh, submitting it uh, somewhere else, uh, specifically if it is career-wise um, and time-wise uh, for you of importance. But there's no other edge rule. I don't know what uh, Dr. Halpin and Dr. Yeah. Eifert have to comment on, but it's a tricky, tricky point. I, I would definitely like to add, um, if you are in an academic setting, um, I think the best way to politely ask about it is to imply that promotion and tenure process is coming up and you really need a response. You need to have an understanding of a timeline um, so you can include this in your promotion and tenure packet. Um, I think a lot of under, uh, editors understand that language and they understand a little bit of urgency in, in getting a response to you and get, uh, establishing a timeline for you. Um, and that's personally been my experience as an author, but also um, as an assistant editor, I've fielded those type of inquiries and I kind of find that that's the best way to prompt the editor to, to give a response. So that's just my two, two cents. Dr. Halpin, do you have anything to add? I agree with both of you, but I think that's fantastic advice. Just remember to be very polite. Uh, try to give them all the information that you can in that email. You know, tell them sometimes the journal will assign a number to your article and you want to make it as easy as possible for them to find your article and, and uh, lay out uh, what you're asking and that you appreciate uh, everything they've done for you. Um, because you, you don't want to come across as demanding. Um, otherwise, you, you might get a, a negative response of, well, we, we don't have time for that and you can go elsewhere. Um, so, so just, you know, being considerate of what the receiving end might, might, might be getting there. Um, Dr. Rose, there's one more question here it's before we move on to our expert reviewers. Um, it's, is it appropriate to add a new co-author if a reviewer request uh, is outside the scope of your knowledge? Hmm, I have never experienced actually that kind of request. So I'm a little bit um, hanging there. I don't know. Uh, did you or Dr. Eifert, did you experience this one? So I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, my, my thought process would be that it, it really depends on what the reviewer is asking. I mean, if they're asking for substantial revisions and completely changing your, your paper, so much so that you need an additional author to write that in. Um, you, you know, I, that's, that's really, really, really tricky. Um, I'm with Dr. Rose where I've never seen that happen. I would find that really unusual. Um, but I don't think it's outside of the scope. I don't think it's impossible. So my guess would be asking the editor, you know, you can write a claim, you know, request to the editor that says, you know, this, the reviewer has asked that I do this. It is not within the scope of my expertise. 
Um, and I think there's going to be additional changes to my paper that I'd like to add, a, add, add an additional author to it um, and see what the editor says. Um, it could be a simple yes or no, absolutely, absolutely not. So it really depends. Thank you both. And I'll also add, uh, Dr. Rose made a, a really important point uh, that you don't really have to answer everything. Uh, I mean, you need to respond to everything, but you don't have to make every change that all the reviewers are suggesting. And um, and I'd, I'd say in most cases, if some if a reviewer is asking for this level of, of change, it's probably going to be rejected um, with that journal uh, if it's a rewrite of your paper. But if, if this this certainly could happen, as Dr. Eifert said, there's there's always a possibility, um, and it might be that you are responding to editor and, and telling them, you know, this is a situation, should I add someone? Or, or it might be, hey, this is not within the scope of what we're looking to do and fully explain why that's the case. And honestly, that might be enough to uh, get, you know, a, a response that, that's positive from the journal. Um, so I think there's lots of avenues there. There's not a one size fits all but hopefully that's, uh, that's helpful for your uh, question there. Um, Judy, I think we can move on to the next section, which is our expert reviewers. And um, I, I know that uh, Dr. Eifert and Dr. Rose will echo me in, in our appreciation for uh, having these expert reviewers on. Uh, Drs. Baker, Beach, and Sands are all experts in, uh, in their field. Uh, that have contributed significantly to GSA journals. Um, so we're very lucky to have them here. We're going uh, to have uh, some a number of startup questions that I'll be asking them. And um, then we will move on to your questions. So please feel free to go ahead and start populating the chat if you'd like to do that. If there's anything that is on the tip of your tongue uh, that, that you'd like, for us to circulate, go right ahead and, and put it in the chat, or perhaps our conversation that, that we'll be having now will um, make you think of some things. Um, Doctors Baker, Beach, and Sands, do you want to start off with, is there anything that you'd like to start off with? Uh, you're welcome uh, to do that, or we can jump right into the questions that we have on the next slide. I think we're good. Judy, thanks so much. So we'll start with that first question there. Uh, if you could each just, whoever's happy to take it first, tell us uh, your approach to reviewing a paper. Um, this is Laura Sands. And um, I, as editor, I was reviewing about 250 papers a year. Uh, <laughs> so, wow. um, the, so consequently, I had to be more efficient in my process. So I started out with the abstract. And so that reason why I mentioned that is because if your abstract is not absolutely clear about not only what the topic is, but the novelty of the topic and the methods and the results. And if I can't use the abstract to really understand the paper, then I already have formed an opinion about the rest of the paper. So I wanted that to to, to give you that um, in advance, because sometimes we get tired by the time we finish the paper and we just put together the abstract really quickly. And that's not what you want to do. You want to make sure the abstract is very clear and compelling. I just want to echo that as well. Thank you, Laura, for mentioning that. Again, I'm, I'm Editor-in-Chief of Ethnicity and Health and reviewed quite a few papers myself, and I, I definitely agree that the abstract is really where the editors focus a lot of your initial attention. So that really is where, like Laura said, what Dr. Sand said, excuse me, where you need to focus a lot of your efforts. Yes, you put a lot of work and time into the actual manuscript, but really just like with a grant, you know, you have to have that initial statement to basically catch the interest of the editor which he or she or they will eventually move it on to the review process. So definitely focus on the abstract. And thank you, Dr. Sands, for mentioning that. Yeah, and I would I would echo um, Dr. Sands and Dr. Baker. I you know I typically I, I don't do as many reviews as Dr. Sands. Uh, I may review 
you know, 20 or 30 papers a year. Um, you know, I always look for things that are, you know, that I have expertise in, that I'm interested in. And part of that, obviously what you see is the abstract. So, you know, when you get asked to review a paper, you're provided with the abstract basically. And so if that's not well done, clear, um, it, it's gonna, I think, limit who ends up reviewing the paper. I mean, that's certainly something that I, I look at. Um, as far as approaching reviewing a paper, I think I could start, I have a few just general comments. I mean, I, I, I'm always fascinated by when I, I, I learn, first of all, I can tell you, I learn from other reviewers. You know, I, I always do. I mean, it's interesting. You know, I'll make my comments. I'll read through the paper at least a couple of times. Um, I, I, I tend to take a broad approach. I tend not to do you know, this word by word editing unless unless there really is some yeah you know, it's poorly written or there's obvious errors or something i mean i, I kind of look for for overall logic consistency um between you know the lit review the research questions the methods the analysis and i look for real what i really look for and this is probably just my background i mean i'm a methodologist in addition to um I have extra expertise in say family caregiving and, and elder mistreatment and things like that. But I look for clear descriptions of the methods. One of the things I always, it's a kind of a pet peeve of mine as a reviewer is not having enough information about say the measures or, you know, what exactly, how are you measuring this construct or why did you choose to, you know, collapse these variables into for your analysis and exactly what did you do? I mean, kind of those specific details. I always look for that. And another main thing, and I'll stop, um, is I look for authors' awareness of possible bias in their work. You know, I mean, do they have sort of a, you know, are they anticipating, and this really comes in the limitation section. You know, no paper is perfect. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a perfect paper, right? So, but at least being aware, here's what we did. Here's here's some of the limitations. Here's here's some of the things we could do or think about, but we have we, you know it's beyond the scope. So those are just some general comments. I'll let the others jump in. I have some other things I can add, but in terms of my approach, uh, I try to focus on major, you know, major things as much as possible. I think other reviewers do a really good job. I've been on papers where there some of the reviewers, their attention to detail is amazing. It's like eagle eye, you know, and they pick up things that I certainly don't don't pick up. So I mean, I'll stop there. You know, I, I definitely agree with Dr. Beach and thank you for mentioning um, how you, you know, a, a review your papers. And for myself, another thing that I specifically look for are your aims and hypotheses and, re and or research questions. So again, I don't want to have to guess as to what you're trying to ask or what the purpose of your project is all about. So again, that's one of the things that I say for myself that I pay close attention to. Um, are your aims and or hypotheses clearly stated? Um, if it's more exploratory, are your research questions clearly articulated? And again, as a reviewer, um, I don't want to have to guess as to what the purpose of your project and or the submission is all about. So that's one of the things that I would highly recommend that you focus on um, in submitting a paper. And as a reviewer, that's specifically what I look for as well. Uh, this is Laura. And I wanted to comment that um, most of you will be aspiring to publish in journals that are um, published by the Gerontological Society of America, including the journal, Journals of Gerontology, uh, the Gerontologist, Innovation and Aging, um, et cetera. So, so I, thinking about that, these are really high impact journals. And so one of the things that you have to be really careful about is making sure that, as Dr. Beach said, that your methodology, methodology is clearly explained and, and not only explained in terms of what you did, but justified, why did you use those methods? Um, because we really do only <laughs> publish, our, our society as a general, only publish really good articles. And so I want you to be really uh, mindful that your, your methods are on par with what you've been reading in other GSA journals. 
Thank you all for that. This is some really fantastic advice. Um, and I see uh, questions in the chat and I just want you to let you know, I, I see you and we'll get to you in just a moment. We're gonna um, move on to the next question on the slide here. What tips do you have for authors when responding to peer reviewers? Well, I'll, I'll start, this is Laura. If you want the reviewers to understand that you've really addressed their comment, you literally write their comment slash question slash suggestion, and then underneath it, your response. And your response has to be clearly um, stated such that the reviewer understands that you've thought about it, you've addressed it. Um, and if you, if you feel that it's not relevant to the point of the paper, then you express why. So just making it very, very easy for the reviewer to, uh, first of all, the, the, the editor, um, to understand that you've, you've done your work in responding to comments, but then as a reviewer see those comments, they can really understand how you've responded to each of them. And I want to add one thing that you should not do is, like Laura said, you know, you mentioned what the author, um, excuse me, what the reviewer's comment um, was, but one of the things you don't want to do say thank you we provided additional information I mean you that's very vague and I've seen this time and time again if you included an entire paragraph I would prefer to see that entire paragraph that you included um, another thing that you know it's not necessarily a pet peeve of mine but I would prefer as a reviewer even as an editor to see like I said outline in a table exactly what and how you responded to the reviewer's comments. What I don't want to have to do sometimes, you know, sometimes the authors will highlight their changes in a different color in the manuscript. Not saying that's not appropriate, but again, you want to make it as easy as possible for the reviewer to see that you responded to his or her, their comment. Also any feedback that the editor may have. So again, your job, is to yes, respond to the feedback, but also make it very clear what you did. And then also make it easier for the editor and or reviewer so that they don't have to take the time to say, you know what, this is too much. I'm just gonna recheck this paper. You want to make it so that they say they answered, my, they responded to my feedback. I greatly appreciate the time that they put into this revision and we're gonna go on and move forward in accepting the paper. So again, make it as easy and reader friendly and very clear as possible for the editor and the reviewers as well. Yeah, I would I would agree with with everything that's been said. I I, I think the point of um, the tricky issue of you know not being able to address something the reviewer brings up. I think that's okay. You know, I think not everything can be addressed. I mean, it's particularly. If it, it's if it's in a, a request to in the author's view, you know, expand the scope of the paper beyond what you know what, what, what the original scope was, you know. So I think you know, if you can't address something, just clearly and concisely explain why, you know, give give an argument, say, you know, this this can't be addressed because X, Y, and Z, you know. Um, again, I don't expect typically authors to expand the scope of the work. Uh, unless there, there are, you know, additional analyses or things that se seem like obvious holes, things that would be more reasonable to address an additional analysis, additional way to look at the data. But, but that, I think that's another important, and it was raised very well in the slides, by the way, I mean, the tips for responding to peer reviews. I think the presentation we heard from Dr. Eifert and Rose was, was, was right on point. So, um, hey, thanks so much. So, um, next question, what are the most common opportunities you see for improvement? Well, I mean, I'll just let me keep the, the floor for a minute. I mean, this echoes what I, what I had said before. I, I think what I run into mostly is imprecise descriptions of methods and analysis but that maybe that's again that's just my bias or what my expertise is but i think you know people sort of just um spend a lot of time writing you know a long introduction lots of lit reviews and then they get to what they're doing and it's kind of i remember i when i taught 
in uh, research methods or survey methods, we have papers and they'd spend 10 pages on the background and one page on the methods or something. But so details on methods, uh, you know, I think just be being precise and clear on why you did what. And, and as I said before, being humble, thinking about the limitations of your paper and not just these stock, you know, you see there's a lot of stock limit, you know, everybody lists certain limitations, but thinking clearly about alternatives or, you know, uh, um, potential biases and how you may may be able to to, to address them, but maybe not. So, um, and let me just make make one more comment. I, I think we haven't really talked about it, and I don't, I don't want to open up like a a, a rabbit, uh, you know, a, a, a big issue here. But the issue of theory, I, I I run into this all the time when I write papers and. And I think certain journals even require theory testing or you know hypothesis testing. I I I've always been a big fan of sort of applied work that that, that has a logic to it that's you know an extension or an innovation of previous previous research. You know I think presenting models can be tricky. Uh, maybe I'm going beyond the scope of what's on the slide here, but I think presenting theories and models can be can be dicey in a paper. I mean, sometimes it really strengthens the paper, but at other times you can't test everything in that model. And I think that's one of the common things, you know, that, that, that we'll, a reviewer will look at a, the figure. So um, I would be careful, just be, be careful. If you have a, a, if the journal requires a theoretical background, please, pro, you know, provide it. If you can't, most theories are very broad and you can't test everything in one paper. So I, I would just think clearly about that. Um, I think you see a lot of comments on that. So I'll, I'll stop there. I just want to add as well, and, and thank you, Dr. Beach, for mentioning that. And I guess I'm coming from the perspective uh, as an editor. Um, and, and I know that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but I think it's, it's going to be extremely helpful is that sometimes, especially for junior scientists, um, it's okay to reach out to the editor and send a quick email asking if the paper is appropriate for that journal. I think that saves time. Um, and one of the things that I would highly recommend that if you choose that route, be sure you have the manuscript and or the abstract ready to be reviewed. Um, just don't you know, send an email saying, this is what we're thinking about submitting to the journal and there's no substance behind it. Again, that's wasting my time, that's wasting your time. So again, be very clear, um, you know, when you do reach out to the editor and or reviewer or associate editor that you have the document actually ready to be submitted. So if they say, yes, this is perfect. Uh, fit for our journal that you can go on and submit it. There shouldn't be this back and forth. Well, can you send me your manuscript or can you send me the abstract? So just, just a word of advice um, in moving forward. And it may not even just be for junior scientists, but just in general, if you want to reach out to the editor, I think it's a great idea um, to do that, but also be prepared um, to have your manuscript ready to be forwarded and or attached to the email so they can give you immediate feedback. So as a editor, former editor, I want to say that it's a really great idea to look at existing papers in the journal to which you want to submit and look at really dissect that paper in the introduction. How did they build their argument for why the the hypothesis they were testing is not only important, but has never been addressed before. And what will it, it, what will it provide for us in the future so that we can build on the work that you're presenting? You know, how did, how did they write the methods? Um, and, and so you'll look at prior articles and show, see how they, they outlined the methods such that they're, they're completely clear and, and comprehensive of what you did to derive your results and so on and so forth. So, so don't be afraid to look at art, other articles as models for how you should structure your article um, and each section of your article. Thank you each of you for that. Uh, we have one last question on our slide before uh, comments from the attendees. 
so what do you personally like to see in responses from authors? I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. Fundamentally, you've got to answer their question. And so evading it um, is, is not a, a, a good tactic. So be thoughtful about what their question is. And sometimes I'll ask my co-authors to help me interpret what the point was that the, the reviewer was making, and they may have interpreted it differently. And so we want to get a kind of a 360 degree view of what the comment was to make sure that we're clearly addressing every aspect of that comment. And I just want to add, um, and, and it may not necessarily be addressing this particular question, but use your senior advisors slash mentors, particularly those that are junior scholars um, in receiving feedback and even responding to reviewers and responding to editors. I think sometimes as a junior scholar, we may feel embarrassed if we have to ask for help, but I think it's important particularly um, in, in writing manuscripts and submitting manuscripts and trying to appropriately uh, respond to reviewers that you need senior scholars in your corner to help you through this process. It's sometimes a difficult uh, process to navigate. And again, this is why they are considered more senior because they've been through this process before. And one of the things that I also would like to put out there is that for those that, for example, are taking a dissertation and or a master's thesis and trying to submit this, you know, Dr. Beach mentioned that you have like 10 pages of an introduction, and then you have maybe a brief paragraph of your methodology. Um, be very careful when you transfer, when you take your, uh, for example, your dissertation or, and or your master's thesis and submitting it. I don't want 15 pages of background and then like Dr. Beach said, we only have a paragraph of your methodology and then you don't have anything left even for the discussion. So just be very mindful in, in doing that, but also use your senior mentors, use your senior advisors to help you navigate this process. Yeah, and I, I, I would just say as a practical way to, to do that, what I've found useful is to actually look at have them provide examples of their responses to previous articles. How did they respond to the, you know, to the, to the, to the editors and get examples. Um, I think we've covered some of the basics, you know, in, in terms of what we like to see in responses or just concise, specific answers to the questions that, that we raised, the honest attempts, you know, to, to, to make the, to, to respond to the reviewers. And if you, if you feel that you can't, lay out the reason why, you know, provide a justification, but I think there's not much more to add. Um, I, I do want to add one more comment. I know particularly a lot of the uh, GSA-based journals, they have a reviewer and training uh, component, and I would highly advise uh, for folks to take advantage of that because this gives you an opportunity to serve as a reviewer, but you also, again, had that mentorship of a of senior reviewer to help guide the process. And this really gives you a better idea of how this works. It's an infrastructure and how this infrastructure of reviewing papers works and you know, how individuals respond. And you know, again, this can be used as an example, as was mentioned by Dr. Sands and Dr. Beach, you know, use examples of what's already been provided but also take advantage of such opportunities as a reviewer in training. A great point. Thanks for bringing that up. And I want to two plugs for that. So, well, there's, there's a couple avenues. So one, there is a, a volunteer portion of the GSA website where you can actually go on and say, I, I'd like to do some reviews and then they can pair you up in that way. Um, and the other way would be finding someone that's in the field that you are working in or that you want to grow in. And uh, as you've heard from our expert reviewers here, they're getting a lot of papers to review. So you can tell them, hey, I'm, I'm interested in, in tagging along. Maybe next time you get a paper to review, would you be willing for me to um, do it with you and, and learn the process? So thank you um, all for your, for 
your responses to those questions. I see there's one question from the audience in the chat from Angie Perone. There's actually it's a, a two-parter. So the question is, what is the editor's role in navigating conflicting reviewer responses, if any? Do editors respond privately to reviewers or authors if they disagree with a major suggestion? Uh, I'll start. Um, frankly, that doesn't happen very often. Mostly the reviewers agree very much. And, and as Dr. Beach pointed out, some reviewers will be very um, focused on some aspects of the manuscript and less on others and the other reviewers fill in otherwise. So as an editor, it's our responsibility to make sure the review is not only um, robust in terms of you know, the reviewer spent sufficient time on each review, but the, that the reviews are fair. And so as editors, we really have to make sure that we read the reviews before we make a decision. We don't just have them say, Mark, you know, accept, you know, major revision, minor revision. We don't do that. We really read through each of the reviews. And so you'll see in some editor's comments, pay particular attention to you know, and, 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 and then they'll explain which ones that you want to pay particular attention to. Believe them. That's what they want you to pay attention to because fundamentally it's the editor that makes the final decision. That means that some of the other reviews though you should respond to them are not as important as those to which they say pay particular attention to. If there is a reviewer that's been um, less than um, attentive to the manuscript or less than professional in their their, um, their review, then we do just simply eliminate that review and find another reviewer. Okay, we have one more question here. This one's from uh, Todd Becker. And um, it's, he says, if or when is it, is it appropriate to request any input from an editor? And uh, he goes on to describe a, a situation that he had where he was having to um, justify his methodological technique and simply rewarded a, a sentence there. But I think that kind of that overarching question that he begins with, when is it appropriate to request an input from the editor uh, might be good to, to sit on. Well, when, when I was editor of Innovation and Aging, we talked with our entire editorial board about how you write reviews um, and so, in other words, we want those those reviewer comments to be as clear and um, as targeted as possible. Um, and so, when you say when you want response from the editors, I'm I'm not perfectly clear about the question. But are you saying to make um, the reviewers' comments more clear, or are you saying uh, you want advice as to which? which comments to respond to. I'm, I'm not very clear about that, but I think we've been pretty clear. You try to respond to all of them. John, perhaps you could you could clarify the question. Yeah, I think it could be um, interpreted either way. Um, I'll give uh, an example of my own experience that I'd love to hear. And I think that maybe this uh, will get at what, what uh, Todd Becker is asking about. So. I had a, uh, a reviewer that um, was asking some questions about uh, a particular methodology that um, I thought made it seem like the reviewer wasn't well versed in, in the methods. It's a very particular area of conversation analysis that not many people are doing. And I, and I thought actually responding in this way um, would uh, not be true to the methods. Um, so I, I think maybe getting at the, the, question, the question that Todd Becker is asking here is, uh, is this type of situation appropriate for uh, maybe asking the editor to, to adjudicate uh, yeah. what's happening and what's the best way to go about that? Yeah, it, it is fair to, to, to email the editor and, and get a, a, a discussion going with the editor regarding a, a, a comment that the, the person submitting the manuscript felt was not really relevant to the purpose of the manuscript. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Drs. Baker, Beach, I think, uh, do you have any, any comments on that question from our attendee? 
No, I think Dr. Sands covered it very well. Yeah, yeah. No, nothing to add. And we are approaching the end of our allotted time. I want to just one more uh, shout out to our attendees. If there's any other questions, if you can, please feel free to pop them into the, the chat. Um, all of our expert reviewers um, and also our, our, um, our core group that's, that's given this presentation have agreed that if you think of a question afterwards that um, is kind of a burning question that we didn't get to, you feel free to reach out to any of us by email and, and we can communicate in that way. And I think it's very generous uh, of each of you to do that. So thank you for that offer. Um, I think that uh, this is, like, like I said at the beginning, this is something that I wish that I had had early on. I know that's been echoed by uh, others here and I hope it's been uh, helpful for, for attendees. Uh, it's starting some dialogue. Um, a reminder that this will be a larger in-person session at GSA coming up. Um, so those workshops are typically front loaded and the in-person uh, um, conference. So I think it starts on Wednesday in the conference and, and we'll actually have our workshop in person on uh, Wednesday. So a number of us uh, that have put together this presentation along with some of the others in the series will be there and can help uh, guide you along in the process then. Um, so seeing no more questions, I again want to lastly thank everyone for attending and everyone for contributing to this presentation and making it a success. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.